Living longer, living healthier, living better than ever before. Welcome to Mountain Pacific's Healthy Living for Life, a weekly series that gives you the information, education, and expert insight you need to become an active participant in today's ever-changing healthcare climate. Here now is today's program host. Summer is here and so is the heat. If you think the sun and hot weather weigh on you more than they used to, you're probably right. As we age, we have more trouble dealing with heat for a number of reasons. So what can you do about it? That's exactly what we're going to talk about today. I'm your host, Lisa Sather. Welcome to Healthy Living for Life, a show dedicated to helping you do just that. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Thanks for joining us this morning. Heat stroke, sunstroke, heat exhaustion. We've all heard these terms, but how are they different? And why do we have more trouble coping with the heat as we age? I'm here this morning with Dr. Richard Sargent, who's going to help answer some of these questions for us. Good morning, Dr. Sargent. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Thank you. So let's start out by talking about why older adults have trouble dealing with temperature changes and why are summers harder on them than they used to be? Well, people used to die younger and they didn't get as sick as they do now. We pour thousands of pills into people every day. A lot of those pills help to decrease your ability to handle heat. We use a lot of pills that help to squeeze water out of you and the way we handle heat is by squeezing water out of us in the form of sweat. Heat stroke, heat exhaustion, and um, heat cramps all come from dehydration and a lack of salt, and we all know sweat is salty. Mm -hmm. So when we decrease all of those things, we start to set ourselves up for the problems that come from heat. As we go through that, when we get people who are already compromised, their heart's already compromised, they're diabetic and they're losing fluid that way, they have less reserve capacity than they used to have. Makes sense. <clears throat> so any of these factors definitely can put seniors at risk for serious illnesses related to heat, but we've heard that the best cure for heat-related illnesses is stopping them before they start, right? <laughs> so do you have some tips on how to prevent heat-related illnesses? Boy, I brought every kind of prop I could today to get this thing going. The first thing I want to tell people is, look, it's often cooler outside. If you live in a trailer in Miles City, Montana with no shade around it, if you go out to the north side of that trailer, it's going to be cooler because you're living in an oven, a solar oven, but an oven. So today, here in the studio, it's 69 degrees, but outside in this morning on the west side, it's 45. So it's 25 degrees cooler outside right now. Now that's not gonna be the case on a hot summer day at noon or two o'clock in the afternoon, unless you're living inside a trailer with no ventilation and no air conditioning. But you've gotta keep that track of that. So this handy dandy little indoor outdoor thermometer could save your life because you'll recognize when it's cooler outside. The other way we use it at our house is when it's cooler outside than it is inside, we open the doors, put on the fans and start blowing air through the house to cool off the house. On top of that, there's several other things you can do. I think the most important one that I ran across as we were doing this, and I didn't realize it when I started, is you need to turn off the lights. Lights are an incredible source of heat, and if you're sitting here in front of studio lights, you understand that. Mm -hmm. But um, I've got this little prop here. I've had this light on for, I don't know, 20 minutes, and right now room temperature is about 75 degrees by this thermometer. Each light has a certain uh, amount of temperature that it sets off. This is an incandescent light. It is the literally the hottest light out there. When you measure the top of the globe of the light, it can get up to, are you ready for this? 439 oh degrees. Oh Don't touch the top of it, it gets pretty warm. If you look at a compact fluorescent light, the reason it doesn't put out as much heat is not that it doesn't get as hot, it's that it doesn't use as much electricity to generate the same amount of light. So a compact fluorescent light gets up to about 221 degrees on the glass. And uh, it doesn't put out as much heat simply because lower, lower wattage. And then this dandy little LED light here, I put in this lamp, left it on for five hours with my uh, thermometer on top of it, and the thermometer got clear up to 110 in five hours. 
Now, if you look over here, we've gone from 70 to 95, just as I've been talking about this. I can tell you if I leave it on there for about two minutes, it'll get up to 160 oh, wow. very quickly. And if you leave it on for an hour or more, what you basically got is your Susie Homemaker Easy Bake Oven mm -hmm. that actually ran off a 100 watt light bulb oh, wow. and could get up to 500 degrees very easily. Wow. So there we go, we're up to 100 degrees and we've done it just as I've been talking. So turn your lights off when Oh really? You want to lower yeah, the temperature, turn those right? lights off, it'll cool off, yeah. But it gets dark too. Um, there's some other things you can do to help cut that down. Yes. Light comes through windows as light, then it hits something inside and it gets turned to infrared. And when it turns to infrared, it's warm. So when you're wearing black, you're going to get hotter than when you're wearing light colored clothing. Good to know. Now that works when you're outside too. And when you're outside, you want to avoid lights. So you put on a hat to shade your face and you put on, this is a blue shirt, but a white shirt would work too. Mm -hmm. I've got light colored pants on and they're very light fabric. That means they're going to breathe. So when I sweat, the air can get through the clothing and it will start to cool me off. But on top of that, I'm cutting down on the amount of light hitting my skin. And we all have short sleeve shirts and shorts, and we think that's what you wear in hot weather. But if you're working in hot weather, this is actually a better, a better outfit. Great, well, we have about a minute left. Can you show us maybe <laughs> some of your other uh, props Well, real quick? if you want to cool off, I have this dandy little rice sock, which we have used in the past to put in the microwave Ooh. and warm up. Yeah, Very it's nice cool, cool, isn't it? Yes, it's been in the freezer great. for about three days. The other thing I have here today is my $20 room air conditioner that I put together off of something I found on the internet. It's just a styrofoam box with a piece of ice in it and a fan duct taped to the top. And when we turn it on, I'll have to turn this at you because I know you're warmer than I am. Well, I appreciate that. Other things you can do. Water bottles. Yes, you need to drink water. Remember, you're trying to sweat. If you're trying to sweat, you've got to have something to put out, and you want to drink a lot of water. So I've got a couple of different ones that are insulated. That works real nice. You can use a little spray mister, and that mist actually cools the air. Right? Great. Well, okay. Thank you. We're out of time. Up next, thank you, Dr. Sargent. We'll have Kelly Butenko, emergency responder. Thank you. Stay tuned. Kelly Butenko joins us now, a paramedic who will talk with us about what to do in an emergency situation caused by heat. Thanks for being with us today, Thanks. Kelly. Thanks for having me. So we've heard of people getting heat stroke, sunstroke, heat exhaustion. Tell us a little bit, are these different terms for the same problem or how are they different? They are all different, but they're all problems along the same continuum of heat emergencies. The least serious of these is heat rash which happens when there's sweat on your skin and you're just, it's just not able to evaporate. So you might have two areas of skin, say your arm rest, rubbing against your underarm, um, where the sweat's just not able to evaporate, and that could cause a rash. The next most serious is heat cramps, and that's just a painful involuntary muscle cramp. They usually happen in your calves or your arms or your uh, stomach or your back and it's when you're exercising outside or doing other physical activity in a warm environment. And you sometimes might see these, like if you're watching college football and um, down in the southeast where it's hot and humid, you might see football players working with trainers on the sidelines trying to stretch out um, because they've got a heat cramp. The next most serious along that continuum would be heat exhaustion. And that can happen in two ways. One is similar to heat cramps where the person might be uh, exercising or doing some sort of physical activity. Another way that you can suffer heat exhaustion is just being in a warm environment for an extended period of time without having enough hydration. You're not drinking enough water. So say we hear about a heat wave in Chicago where it's 105 for days on end, especially older people are affected um, and they're just not able to get out of that warm environment and they're not hyd hydrating properly. And the thing to worry about with heat exhaustion is it can quickly become heat stroke if it's not treated and heat stroke is by far the most serious 
of the conditions. Um, heat stroke is when your body loses its ability to regulate its own temperature. You, can't, you just can't cool off and it affects the brain, it affects the kidneys, it affects the muscles, it affects the heart. It can have long-term ramifications and it can be life-threatening. Thank you. So heat emergencies can start with a, something as simple as a heat rash and progress, obviously, to heat stroke. What are some symptoms we should be on the lookout, you know, real quickly b before we get to that, that situation? For a layperson, I like to kind of think of it from head to toe. So what's their mental status? You know, are they alert? Are they oriented? Do they know where they are? Um, they might be dizzy. They might feel a little faint. They might have a headache. You know, working down a little, look at their skin. It might be cold, cool and clammy. Um, if you continue working down, they'll be breathing um, rapidly. They might be nauseous, they might be vomiting. If you check their pulse, um, it's likely that they're gonna have a fast pulse uh, and a weak pulse. And they also might have the muscle cramps that we had discussed earlier. Okay, so heat stroke per se, some of the symptoms specifically to that, if you're to that position, what would that entail? It's just a little more serious. Again, if we start at the top, they probably have a throbbing headache. Um, their mental status is even worse. They might be con you know, confused, they might be agitated. Um, they could be having seizures. Um, if you look at their skin, again, they've lost the ability to regulate their temperature. So their skin, rather than being cool and clammy, they're gonna be red, they're gonna be hot, they're gonna be dry. They're not gonna be sweating because they can't sweat anymore. Okay. Um, they're still gonna be breathing very quickly. Um, they'll likely be throwing up, they'll have nausea, they'll have vomiting, um, you know, and they could lose consciousness. That's sort of when you're getting farther and farther down that, down that path. So what do we need to do if a person does progress to this situation for heat stroke? You know, if, it's, if you haven't quite gotten to heat stroke yet and you think they might have heat exhaustion, you just need to get them into a cool place. Um, we would get them cooled down. Get them into a cool place, remove any layers that you can, if they've got a hat, a jacket, a scarf, any extra layers that you can take off. Um, if you can get them into a cool shower, um, or if you um, uh, can give them something to drink. You can give them water or Gatorade, definitely not alcohol, because that doesn't help hydrate you. But as things progress and it becomes heat stroke, that's a life-threatening emergency. And at that point, they need definitive medical care. You know, if you can, are near a hospital and can quickly get them to a hospital, fine. If you, you, if you are not, call 911, because they need more than you can provide. So, and then after, for example, if we've gotten to that point and I've had to call 911, is there anything I can do to help, you know, this, this person next to me before an emergency responder arrives? Yeah, just again, cooling is the most important thing that a layperson can do. Um, you know, take off those layers, um, you know, get them in a shower. You can even um, put them in front of a fan. You could get some wet um, towels or something and put wet towels around their head, around their neck, in their armpits, sort of the warmer areas that'll help cool them down quickly. So do what you can to help cool them before um, the professionals, professionally trained people show up. Anything we should not be doing while we're waiting for the ambulance? Definitely, definitely no alcohol. Um, alcohol does not help hydrate. Um, don't try and cool their uh, body with a any kind of medications. A lot of parents think, you know, my kid has a fever, you give them ibuprofen or Tylenol normally. Um, but that's not gonna help now because your body's temperature regulation is just broken. Um, and also, don't give them anything to drink if they're throwing up or unconscious. There's a chance that they could, um, you know, aspirate something, you know, or compromise their airway. Okay. And then when you get there and just, you know, just in, uh, in 30 seconds or less, can you tell us what you all will do? Yeah, the first thing we're going to do is determine, do we have time to take care of this person on scene or do we need to get going to the hospital immediately? And that'll sort of, you know, send us in the direction of what we need to do next. We're going to rely on bystanders to give us some background. So it's important for the bystanders to be able to tell us how this happened um, and the patient's medical history. But then the next things we'll do is we'll start the cooling if it hasn't happened already. Um, we, we can start IVs and start rehydrating the person. If they are having problems with their airway, if they're unconscious, we'll take care of their airway, give them some oxygen. And then from there, we can check their heart, their blood sugar. We have medications that we can use to um, help control any seizures or any nausea and vomiting, and then we'll get on our way to the hospital. Thank you so much, Kelly. When we come back, how to still have fun in the sun, but stay safe while we do it. Stay tuned.
Thanks for staying with us. Now we'll talk with Chantelle McDuffie and Elaine Elbert, both from Hunters Point Retirement Community, who are experts at helping seniors have fun in the sun while staying safe. And they'll also have some tips on how you can do that too. Thanks for being here, ladies. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes, of course. So you both work at a retirement community, and some folks may not know what that really entails. Can you just give us a quick overview about what that is? Absolutely. Um, when Holiday Retirement was established in 1971, they wanted to create a fun and exciting environment for seniors. So in 1998, Hunter's Point was created and we carried over that same policy then. So we are all inclusive in meaning that when you walk in that door, there's no reason to leave. We walk into a beautiful dining area where they eat three chef prepared meals a day. We have housekeeping and we have activities for the mind, body and spirit. So it, it's all inclusive. Wonderful. So speaking of activities, can you tell us a little bit about what some of the activities are that you plan for your seniors? Well, my job is an enrichment coordinator and that's what I try to do is coordinate activities that enrich our residents' lives. And we have exercise six days a week. Um, we do different types of exercise to keep it fresh and fun. Um, we have lots of games, both intellectual games like cards and pinochle and blitz and bridge games going on there. And we have physical games that encourage you to stay active and just enjoy yourself. And those games include Wii Bowling and Wii Golf. Uh, we enjoy um, volleyball. It's armchair volleyball, but it's volleyball. We play beanbag baseball. In the summer, we do horseshoes and croquet, outdoor games. And we encourage our residents to um, get active in the community as well, you know, and join in. Uh, we have a senior serving society that we um, help out food share and the Humane Society and Montana Supporting Soldiers, um, Purple Caps for Babies. Wonderful. So. All kinds of things. All <laughs> kinds of things. And we do talent shows and fashion shows. And um, we have Let's Talk Seniors, which teaches our res residents, gives our residents an opportunity to, to learn more about maybe a medical issue. Okay. Or um, we have Ellen Baumler often comes and speaks to us from the Montana Historical Society on different subjects, which the residents absolutely love as well. Wonderful. Tell us a little bit about what you do for summertime activities to help keep the seniors safe while they're outdoors. Well, we encourage our residents to go on outings with us. Mm -hmm. And while they're on the outings, we do encourage them to to bring along their hat, their sunscreen, um, their bottle of water. Mm -hmm. And we have, um, each resident has available to them a great call system, which has a GPS tracker on it and everything. So whether they're right at Hunter's Point or whether they're just around town or around the state or even out of state, um, those great call systems, they can just push the button when they need help and, and get the help. And if they aren't able to do it for themselves, another resident or one of the staff members like myself or one of the other staff members that comes with me can push that button and we can get help immediately for them. That's great. So you mentioned the water bottle and staying hydrated. Can you at all speak from first-hand experience on why that's so important for them to be staying hydrated, especially when it's hot? Just they're healthier, they're happier, and we can have a better time if we stay hydrated, especially in the summertime. Good, good, good. So what about indoor activities for staying out of the heat? I think you kind of briefly mentioned some of those and you plan some of those types of things for your residents. Um, any other things you wanted to mention about some of their indoor activities just to keep them inside and keep them cool? Well, some of the outdoor games that you like horseshoes, um, we might do that indoor on a hot day and do it with plastic horseshoes, of course. Wonderful. But, um, and we have a bell choir. 
so our residents can join the bell choir and do bell choir practice. We have um, all kinds of spiritual activities as well. We have Bible studies and church services, all different kinds. Uh, we do cooking classes um, and have a little bit of fun with that. And this week we're actually, in fact today, we are doing jelly bean creations. And so we've encouraged the staff to make jelly bean creations and make samples. And then we've encouraged our, we're encouraging our residents to come and participate in that, make a jelly bean creation. That's awesome. That's great. Um, and maybe just in, you know, in, a, in 30 seconds or so, and maybe Chantel can speak to this too, any other quick tips you can offer based on your experience with planning summer activities for your residents in the retirement community? Absolutely. We focus a lot on when it's warm out, proper hydration. And so we always watch out for one another. If, if somebody is acting a little bit weird, then that's some time that we'll need to address that situation. But we always have water readily available on any outing that we take. So hydration is, is really a major key in protecting yourself from that sun and that heat as well. That's great information and of course Dr. Sargent mentioned a lot of this information earlier so I really appreciate you guys taking the time to reiterate how important that is for our seniors so Absolutely. thank you both for being here today. Thank you. So that's our show this week and I want to thank you so much for joining us. Remember to get out there and be active but drink a lot of water obviously we've talked about that today and keep cool. Until next week stay fit, stay well and stay healthy for life with Healthy Living for Life. Healthy Living for Life is brought to you by Mountain Pacific Quality Health. We'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions for future programs, visit our website at mpqhf.org or call us at 406-443-4020. You can also catch us on YouTube by visiting our website and clicking on the YouTube icon. Special thanks to Fire Tower Coffee House and Roasters. Production facilities provided by Video Express Productions.